Jason. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and thank you to the Positive Action Group and the Free Thinkers and for all of you for coming along. It's really great to be here. So I work for Transform Drug Policy Foundation. We are a charity and think tank campaigning for an end to the war on drugs and its replacement with a, a system of legal control and regulation. When we say we campaign for legalisation, the common response is, oh my God, are you asking for a free for all? Are you talking about drugs in sweet shops? No, we're not. We're talking about a system of strict legal control and regulation where we take the market out of the hands of gangsters, put it in the hands of governments so we can effectively get it under control. This is about doctors, pharmacists, licensed retailers. Anyway, just to get a gauge of the audience, um, a bit of audience interaction, uh, can you put your hands up if you support the status quo? Okay. What about decriminalisation? Okay. Legal regulation? Not sure. Okay, some work to be done. <laughs> Just going to do the next slide. So the, the three th key things I want to talk about tonight. First of all, what are the costs of the war on drugs? Second of all, what alternatives do we have? And why I think, or why you could argue the Isle of Man should take a lead on this issue. And this, this slide's about our Anyone's Child campaign, which uh, Ray will talk about more later. Over to the next slide, please. So, we've been fighting a war on drugs for 50 years now. Uh, this started off in 1961 with the UN Single Convention on Narcotics Drugs. This set up the uh, very ambitious aim of stopping the production, supply and use of drugs. The goal was to get rid of opiates within 15 years, coca within uh, 25, with some scientific and medical exemptions. In 1998, the UN set up a new thing, a drug-free world, we can do it. Okay, we're in 2017, and what is very clear is that that goal has not been achieved. I think drugs exist pretty much in every corner of the globe now. The illegal drug market is now estimated to be worth three, have a turnover of £330 billion a year. Worse still, this prohibition enforcement driven approach is causing devastation to vast swathes of the globe. Think Colombia, Afghanistan, Guinea Bissau. And interestingly, some of these unintended consequences were even recognised by a man called Antonio Maria Costa when he headed up the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. The very, very body that is intended to enforce this. And these are all the harms of policy and not of the drugs themselves. So as you can see, we've got 70,000 people who are being criminalised for drug possession every year, wasting 100 million annually trying to enforce this problem. We've got drug use higher than when the war began. And this year, the UK became the highest drug deaths since records began. OK, so these are just some of the costs of drug policy. Can we have the next slide? Now, the Isle of Man hasn't escaped this. So just a quick Google. I've read that 40% of prisoners are in there for drug-related offences. In 2015, there were six drug-related deaths, which is quite high considering the population of the island. And just a couple of weeks ago, there was a very high-profile story about a couple of children who were hospitalised having found drugs in a war. A wall, sorry. What, what we can see through this is, I'm, I'm by no means pointing the finger at the Isle of Man, but I really think that drugs exist pretty much everywhere, and it's an issue that we need to get to grips with. Banning drugs raises their price. This creates enormous profits for criminal entrepreneurs. It thrusts even casual users into an illegal marketplace, encourages heavy users to commit property crime, to acquire higher priced drugs, leaves violence the only way to deal with disputes, corrupts public officials and institutions and undermines society, and makes the drugs themselves far more dangerous. 
All of these effects can be observed and rem are reminiscent of alcohol prohibition in the early 20th century. Transformers set up a campaign called Count the Costs, and we, through this we identified seven key costs of the war on drugs, which you can see listed on the screen. And we've formed this into a volume, of which I've only got the executive summary with me, but it's basically a litany of misery. So if, if you want some cheery reading, I encourage you to read this to see just how bad the drug war has been. <laughs> Next slide. OK, but there are alternatives. We don't have to keep doing what we're doing. So what are the options? This is fundamentally a policy choice. So one thing you can do, and lots of people will argue, is, well, we're not really fighting a war on drugs, so why don't we fight a bit harder? Well, I want to point you all to the case of Mexico, where in 2006 they tried just this, and they really, really ramped up their war on drugs. What's happened in Mexico? Well, since 2006, you have over 150,000 people who are dead as a result of drug-related violence. You have thousands more disappeared. And really, so it showed that as you ramped up this drug war, all that happened was more violence ensued. And I think, you know, really we've been trying this policy for 50 years. Do we really think that fighting harder, filling all our prisons is the right way forward? And, you know, interestingly, Thailand tried a very, very harsh policy back in the early 2000s. They operated almost a shoot-to-kill policy of anyone suspected being of a drug user. Interestingly, over the summer, we got a phone call at Transform from the, from the Thai government asking us to come over and advise them on how to regulate drugs. So it shows that they've gone through the cycle of really strict enforcement come out the other end and gone, God, that really didn't work. We need to look at another approach. And interestingly, the Philippines is now trying it. And if anyone's read about that, they're over, you know, this is literally a shoot to kill policy in the street at the moment. It's very much going on now, and I would suggest the results are going to be disastrous. So another option in terms of what we can do is incremental reforms. This is really currently in place in the UK, actually. Um, pretty much out of pragmatism and because the police are just spending too much police time trying to do this. So we've got, for example, cannabis cautions, which are largely in place if someone should get caught in the street with a small amount of cannabis. It's simply not worth the police time going through the process. We've also got increased tolerance towards harm reduction. So uh, interventions such as uh, clean needles, for example. And these are some of the incremental reformers, but they're very much sort of tinkering at the edges, and I would say not really getting to the crux of the problem. Okay, there's also decriminalisation. Now, decriminalisation is that there are two types. There's de facto and de jure. De facto is where it's sort of done unofficially. De jure is where it's actually legal. And Portugal is the country probably most commonly held up as a place that has decriminalised. It's been in place since 2001. And when they put this policy in action, you know, there was a lot of uh, public criticism that you know, drug use would soar, the sky would fall in, all hell to Portugal. But actually, the stats are quite interesting. And you know, a lot of the stats out there are exaggerated. We have written a report that looks more balanced at the impact. But key, key successes include a massive decline in HIV infection and drug-related deaths. The, use, the massive rise in use didn't materialise, just didn't happen. Over 25 countries are now pursuing this kind of policy, whereby if you're caught in possession of a small amount of a drug, you'll go through a dissuasion court or through a, almost like a driving fine, you know? So you're going around the system rather than to the courts to go through the normal criminal justice approach. Now, I think this policy is brilliant, but it doesn't go far enough. Why? Because we still don't know where the drugs are coming from, what they contain. And so you still end up with this slightly weird loophole where the person caught in possession isn't being criminalised, but where did they get the drug from? which is why I would argue we need to go a lot further and go for the whole legal control and regulation of the market. I'll talk about this in a bit more on the next slide. The fifth option is free market legalisation. 
This is where you literally would make drugs available in sweet shops, a bit like actually we have that alcohol. Now, I'm not in favour of this approach. I think there's a small bit of the libertarian section that might be favour this approach, but I don't think it has overall much traction as an argument. Next slide. <coughs> and this is our drug policy spectrum. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the free market corp control. This is something like what we have for alcohol. And on the right, you can see prohibition, gangster control. That's what we've got for drugs. Transform very much believes that we need to move into the middle ground here. This isn't about a free market approach. It's not about a prohibition. We need government control in the middle. Next slide. So, trans Transform's written what is a really quite large and detailed book on exactly how you go about legally, legally regulating drugs. I've put some um, executive summaries around. Um, as you can see, there's quite a lot to go through here, but I'll just give you some highlights from it. But this is very much available online for anyone to read free of charge, should you be interested. But basically, what we're saying is there are a number of models in which you can regulate. There's medical prescription and supervised venues. This would be for the highest risk drugs and the most problematic users. For example, for dependent users of injectable opiates. The next model is specialist pharmacist sales. This could be for, for, for licensed users with ration volumes. And this would be more for drugs like amphetamines or ecstasy. Third model down, you've got licensed retail and premises for sale and consumption. And this would be more the kind of model we'd propose for alcohol or for a Dutch-style coffee shop. And then at the bottom, unlicensed sales, of which probably you just put a drug like coca tea, something like that might fall into that kind of category. So all, Blueprint also deals with the nerdy aspects of how you actually go about controlling and regulating in quite a lot of detail. It's actually quite boring, but that, that's really what we're trying to do with drugs, to be completely honest. But what we're looking at is issues including production, so ensuring quality control of the products, that kind of thing, making sure it's tested. The products, so ensuring we have dosage, preparation, the vendors, so again, it's about licensing and price structures, outlets, there's location, hours of opening, and then things like buyers, buyer users. So this would be things like putting age restrictions on, uh, restricting access so there's appropriate age controls, the importance of not advertising. So it's all these kind of things that we start to think about. People always imagine when we're talking about legal regulation, they go, I really can't imagine what you're talking about. We're really talking about existing systems that we already have. This is doctors, pharmacists, licensed retailers. And it's about looking at the harms of drugs and putting the drugs in the most appropriate systems. So what I'm not suggesting is that what we're, what we're saying is a complete silver bullet or a panacea to the drug problem. It's a lot more complicated than that. But this book is designed to really outline what an alternative world could look like. Really what we're suggesting isn't radical. Countries should have the freedom to choose their own drug policies. Illegal drugs need to be treated alongside alcohol and tobacco, where we're putting health at the centre and harm. So really we can learn a lot from the lessons of alcohol and tobacco. I mean, I'm interested by tobacco in particular, because after the last, over the last few years, we've done a really good job at decreasing the use of tobacco without making tobacco illegal. And how have we done this? We've banned smoking inside public places, We've gone about putting um, pictures on the packets. We've gone for the shutters so they're behind the view. And we've really done good public education to try and stop children taking up the habit of smoking. Well, these are all regulatory measures that are available in a legal system that I think gives us the flexibility to find the right approach to different drugs.
So support for this issue is massively growing. We've now got supporters including Kofi Annan, uh, a whole stream of former presidents. Uh, in the UK, there are increasingly standing chief constables making progressive stances on this, perhaps most notably Mike Barton in Durham. And just this week, even the British Medical Journal came out actually supporting our Anyone's Child campaign. So this, is, this isn't sort of the stuff of the liberal left and the complete wackos who, you know, this is increasingly being supported by very mainstream figures who have come at this from direct experience trying to enforce it, have gone, look, we really do need to examine a new approach to this. And more excitingly, it's happening. So, you know, I started working in this 10 years ago and people said to me, it's never going to happen. Well, it already is, OK? We've got this year, perhaps most significantly, Canada is about to legally regulate cannabis. We've also got a whole swathe of US states that are doing the same thing. Uruguay is another example of a country doing this. As I said earlier, over 25 countries now have policies of decriminalisation. And even in the UK, which is quite slow on this issue, we're starting to have discussions around decriminalisation and the introduction of things such as safe injecting facilities. So really, I think support and the momentum behind this is really starting to take off. And it's an issue that should be hitting the political agenda pretty soon. So I'm not suggesting that the Isle of Man should legalise all drugs tomorrow, but there's a lot that can be done just tomorrow, literally within even the current, uh, within the current UN convention that we have. And perhaps we should start looking at things like legal regulation of cannabis, decriminalisation of possession, the introduction of heroin-assisted treatment. These are all very doable things and very rational measures of which we have a lot of examples from the international stage that we can learn from, look at the experience and work out what would be suitable for the Isle of Man. I think the time has come to break the politics and the inertia surrounding the drugs issue. It's now about putting child protection at the centre of this debate. We need to have a pragmatic and honest discussion rather than burying our heads in the sand and going, oh, drug use doesn't exist or isn't that a bit of a niche issue? Come on, we need to properly discuss it. And I like to think this is the start of some of those discussions. Let's look at the models of legal control and regulation to see what could work best for the Isle of Man. Thank you very much. And I'd like to hand over to Ray now.